Welcome to Ikhmar. Right. Well, first of all, thanks to the organizers for having me. Um, so what my group is uh, focusing on is developing computation models uh, to better understand how the uh, uh, signaling organizes in time and space to inform cells what cell fates to take on and how to um, uh, build organs that are functional. Right, so um, the main inspiration is uh, actually coming from this movie. So everything in development happens on growing domains. So what we have been interested in is understanding patterning on growing domains. And um, we did not talk about this before, us and I, but uh, this was a perfect introduction to my talk. Um, because the first question we basically asked is like, oops, how can you pattern a growing domain? And as also just pointed out, I mean, you have a fundamental problem there, uh, and that is if you take the French flag model and uh, you have a gradient, you would be specifying your domains uh, accordingly, but if you're now growing and you keep the uh, gradient shape the same, you would just enlarge the uh, final domain, but you would not get proportional patterning. So some mechanism would have to exist uh, to push out that gradient proportional to the uh, growth of the domain. And uh, we focus on the same problem as Arthur, but we got a different answer because we're not geneticists, we're mathematicians. Uh, and uh, so we were inspired by the experiments that were published in 2011. Uh, what you're seeing here is the gradient for decapentaplegic in the ring disk. Uh, and as you can appreciate, uh, the amplitude is increasing over time, but also the gradient is uh, expanding. And if you now normalize, as also showed, if you normalize the uh, uh, concentration on the left-hand side and normalize the size of the domain, it all collapses to a single gradient, and that means this gradient is scaling. And as Arthur pointed out, the massive problem with that is, is if you're thinking in terms of steady state, then you would have to change the length of the gradient by, uh, oops, sorry about that by either changing the diffusion coefficient or the degradation rate. And the question would be, how would the system know how long it is so that it can change it accordingly? So what we uh, got inspired by is the shape of the gradient. So you're getting an increase in the amplitude and the widening of the gradient. So why would you assume it to be in steady state? I mean, this thing is completely dynamic. So we basically decided to just solve that equation on a growing domain. And when you do that and you quantify the length of the gradient, which is pushed out by diffusion, so diffusion is transporting molecules with the square root of time, and the domain is increasing linearly with time, then what you're getting is the gradient length just by diffusion is increasing with the square root of time, with the domain length. In red are the data points from the science paper. In black uh, is the gradient length that you're getting from this diffusion model. So that means like you don't need any kind of feedbacks or whatever. You just need diffusion on a growing domain, and the thing scales perfectly. And uh, then you can, however, worry about readout, because as I said, like it's not just that the amplitude stays constant. It's increasing over time. So if you now have, so here now we have a log scale. So the exponential gradient looks linear. So you have two effects. So the amplitude is increasing <laughs> as measured in the experiment. But at the same time, as you can see here, you have an expansion with the square root of time rather than linear with time. And that means your gradient is not expanding as much as it should. And so the uh, gradient over time, as you go to the uh, darker curves, is shrinking on that scale domain because you don't have enough transport. Uh, it's imperfect. But as you can see, as a result, all the gradients cross in one point. And uh, that means in one part of the domain, nothing changes. And that happens to be the part where Spalt and Dad, the two targets of DPP signaling, are read out. And so that means that you can read out the DPP gradient not everywhere. It's not perfect. You can only read it out where you need it. And so nature wasn't perfect, but good enough to get stuff done. And so that's what we would like to uh, suggest as a mechanism of scaling in the uh, of flow wing disk. So the uh, conclusion from this really fast uh, first part, and it's really good that Arthur gave a proper introduction to it, is that we say, uh, propose we have pre-steady state gradients where the amplitude and the length of the gradient is increasing over time. And uh, 
imperfect scaling and this increase in amplitude, they compensate in a way that you're creating a region within the wing disk where the concentration stays constant and therefore you can use a normal French flag based threshold model to read out that gradient on a growing domain and you're still getting proportional uh, patterns. Right, so, the, uh, so that is a uh, theoretical uh, way of looking at it in 1D, um, but we're also interested in more complex pattern. And a big part of what my group is doing is uh, looking at organ development uh, of lungs and kidneys. And what we're particularly interested in is A, how would you define those branch points? So in a human lung or human kidney, you have m millions of branches. And B, why do they look different? So you don't have to be a biologist to tell a kidney and a lung apart, and that's because the branches form in different ways. In the kidney, you have more like 90 degree angles. In the lung, you have 60 degrees m mostly. And the question is like, what defines A, the um, branch points, B, the direction of branch outgrowth, and C, the um, uh, structure of those branches? And when I started at ETH, uh, that paper had just come out from the Krasnow group. And apparently, like the PhD <laughs> student, looked at mouse lungs for seven years and concluded they all look the same. So at that time, this was revolutionary because previously people had thought it's a stochastic process. So what he found is like there's only three ways of making a branch. You can either have domain branching, you can have bifurcations followed by another bifurcation in the same plane, or you could have orthogonal bifurcation where you have like one bifurcation and another one in an orthogonal plane. And they only occur in certain sequences and they pattern the entire uh, lung tree. And the question was then, like, why would you only get those patterns and what would define them? It must be deterministic because uh, it's uh, the same if you have the same genetic background and only if you change the genetic background do you get a change. So at that time, geneticists had already found out that FGF10 fibroblastic growth factor 10 is both necessary and sufficient to induce a branch. Means like if you load a bead with FGF10, put it next to a lung epithelium, you're gonna get um, a, uh, a new branch. If you take away components of the FGF10 signaling pathway, you're not getting branching anymore. You might get elongation, but not branching. And also geneticists had found out that FGF10 engages in a negative feedback with sonic hedgehog. Uh, and so we translate the biochemistry that people had figured out about those pathways into a set of partial differential equations. So you have a reaction and diffusion term and uh, solve that on a, uh, on a domain. What you're seeing in red is FGF10 signaling. We have a normal vector field as a growth field, so uh, uh, it's growing everywhere, but the strength of growth is proportional to FGF10 signaling, and you can see that this would support branching. Now the question was, like, could that really be the mechanism? It's one thing that you can get it uh, in simulation, but is that what's happening in vivo? So we were uh, fortunate that at that time, uh, a French group had just published 3D shapes of a developing lung. So we took those uh, shapes and calculated displacement fields between those shapes. Uh, from the displacement fields, we can infer the uh, growth fields. And then we could solve our model and also competing models on those shapes. And then uh, <laughs> predict the uh, signaling field for FGF10 and compare that to the growth field. And here you see an example of a perfect match. And the uh, main alternative mechanism that people were thinking about at that time uh, was a geometry-based mechanism. And that is that if you already have that kind of curvature uh, of, the, uh, uh, of the lung bud and you, you express a ligand on that epithelium, the ligand gonna diffuse away. And since you have like a curved geometry to start with, that's gonna introduce a pattern. And now you can either take that ligand to be an activator of branching or growth or inhibitor of growth. And we solved that, uh, those models on those shapes, you only have one parameter, the effective diffusion constant. And uh, you can see that, especially for the inhibitor model, the signaling and the growth field are close, but they're not perfectly overlaying. It means like if you do verbal reasoning, that looks completely plausible. But if you do it quantitatively, uh, you can completely reject such a mechanism. It just doesn't work. And also, if you simulate such a mechanism, then if you start on this plane here, you're going to get uh, the, uh, the signal in the center of the domain. You support the formation of a butt. But once you have a butt, 
you can't make a bifurcation anymore because if you increase curvature, you lose a ligand again, you push the system against you. <coughs> now, if you use the mechanism that we have, which is a Turing mechanism, I'm not going to go into the details of that, uh, you can get a perfect uh, match. Uh, here we screened uh, thousands of parameter sets, and the best parameter sets set gives us a perfect match. This is with the ligand with FGF10 in the mesenchyme and its receptor on the epithelium as it is in biology. If you swap that, you don't get a match anymore, means like it's not arbitrary. It's not like that you can do it no matter what. And sonic hedgehog has this distribution, but it's an inhibitor of branching. And for this, it works again. And also, if you go to later stages with more complex geometries, it still uh, works. Now, the, the referees asked uh, to not just use uh, these, uh, these shapes that came from different uh, uh, embryos and put them together, even though it's a very stereotypic developmental process, but rather have it from a single lung. So it was the first experiment we ever did. Uh, take a, an embryonic lung from a, an embryo, put it under the microscope, uh, and get the, uh, um, the shapes over time. Um, and then you can see here again that a Turing mechanism reproduces the growth fields perfectly, but none of the other mechanisms uh, work. So also on a growing domain, the Turing mechanism can still predict the branch points. <coughs> now, meanwhile, we have obtained proper 3D structures of the entire process. The numbers that you have here on top are somite stages. Uh, somites form about every two hours. You have the full series. Uh, and so we can put that together. We can segment uh, these. We can solve the Turing model also on those shapes. And also here, we are predicting the points of outgrowth uh, many, uh, many stages before you actually see that bud forming. And so that is before any change in curvature occurs. That means the Turing mechanism can really predict uh, those branch points. We can also solve that on such a domain and predict how the Turing mechanism would actually um, predict new branches and support the uh, outgrowth uh, process. You can see that it's still slightly different from the real thing, and we're working on those uh, differences. Now, branching occurs in many different uh, organs, and intriguingly, uh, all of them are based on FGF10 and sonic hedgehog signaling. So the same mechanism, in principle, could guide branching in absolutely all organs except for the kidney. So in the kidney, uh, branching morphogenesis is based on two proteins, GDNF and WIND11, especially GDNF. And GNF is a, um, a very different protein family, a BMP signal. Uh, and so biologists would say, evolutionally speaking, that is completely different, and that might well be the case. Uh, the only thing is that uh, it's mathematically the same, because the ligand is expressed in the mesenchyme, uh, is signaling to its receptor on the epithelium, and uh, is upregulating the receptor. So the, in terms of equations, it's 100% the same. And so we saw, well, okay, let's see whether we can actually match the data. So we cultured uh, a kidney, a uteric bud, uh, under the microscope. Uh, did the same thing again. So we got the shapes uh, and got the growth fields. And indeed, again, uh, with the Turing mechanism, but with none of the other mechanisms, we can predict the points of outgrowth. And we can also solve the free boundary problem of like solving the Turing mechanism on such a uh, shape and let it guide the, the branching, and we're getting a very similar uh, pattern. And so that means that also in the kidney, a branching can be explained uh, with a, a Turing mechanism. Now in the uh, kidney, there's one small difference compared to the lung in terms of regulatory network. In the lung, you would have a negative feedback between FGF10 and sonic hedgehog, while in the kidney, you have a positive feedback between GNF signaling and uh, WIND11. So we wondered why would that be? What good does it do? And the simplest way as a computation person to test that is just simulate it once with and once without. And when you do that, you're getting a picture like this in 2D. And you can immediately see that with that positive feedback, the branches are closer together. And then we looked into the data and tried to explain the data that I just showed you once with and one, once without that WIND11 expression. We saw no difference in the early stages, but in the later stage, we got a better fit if we had positive feedback. And that coincides with the uh, time that within the culture, because of the 90 degree angle branching, the branches eventually come really close to each other. Now, if you're coming really close to each other, 
So then you're competing for ligand. And uh, if you have this positive feedback, you can just come a little bit closer. And uh, so we wanted to test that. And uh, Andy McMain was so kind to uh, give us some kidneys from a Wind 11 uh, heterozygous and null background. And you don't need any statistics to really see that those branches are much further apart. And so that is really the mechanism um, by which you control the distance uh, of branches in the kidney. Right, so the uh, summary for us for this part here is that uh, we propose that it's a ligand receptor-based Turing mechanism that defines the points of outgrowth. Uh, you're separating the uh, ligand and receptor into different t tissues. I didn't show that uh, in order to get robustness to initial conditions. If you don't do that, and biologists have done this, then the Turing mechanism predicts that for the same parameter set, you're going to get different branching patterns. And uh, that's just the property of Turing mechanisms. The interesting thing is when the biologists do that, then for the first time they get a litter with uh, very different uh, branching patterns. And finally, the positive feedback can uh, modulate the exact branching architecture uh, of that uh, network. So that is all on continuous domains, but we are interested, what do the cells actually do uh, during branching? And uh, so we started with light sheet microscopy, and that allows us to uh, get a uh, better resolution of the uh, tissue. So here you're seeing uh, the, in green the epithelium and in red uh, the mesenchyme. And uh, since we got these really nice uh, images, the first question we had was like, what would we actually expect to see in such an uh, uh, epithelium? And the, uh, so we looked into literature, and the uh, epithelium uh, A is polar, so you have a, an apical side and a basal side. If you're focusing on the apical side, so you're getting a uh, polygonal lattice because the cells on the apical side adhere very tightly. Then people have quantified uh, things like the number of neighbors. It looks pretty random. Uh, and they have uh, looked at uh, cell areas, which typically also looks pretty random. And uh, now there's a number of really, really fascinating properties of epithelia. Uh, the first one is that um, cells on average have six neighbors. And that is like if you look at uh, different uh, epithelia, so each dot here is a different tissue type, you have between 30% and 80% hexagons. But no matter what's the fraction of hexagons, on average you have six neighbors. And uh, th this is very, uh, very well understood. It goes down to, it comes down to topology, uh, Euler's formula. Uh, if you're in a contiguous lattice, you must have, on average, six neighbors. And it's just reassuring to see that nature completely abides to mathematics. You know, so you have a variance of like, you know, very, of a very small number. But there are two things that are not, or were not understood. Uh, these are above Weyer's law and Lewis law. So I just told you that, on average, you have six neighbors. But locally, that's not true. Locally, a cell that has many neighbors <coughs> is surrounded by cells that has, on average, few neighbors, and vice versa. And that is formulated in Abov Weyer's law, which tells us that if you take the average number of neighbors of a cell with n neighbors, and you multiply that, so you have here the average number of neighbors oops, that a cell has that has n neighbors times the number of neighbors, it's going to be 5n plus 8. So it was first found in some metal or whatever, like some inorganic material, and all epithelia abide to it. In all epithelia, you get 5n five, five plus 8. Now, there's a second one that goes down back to, to Lewis. So what he realized in the uh, cucumber is that if you quantify the area of each cell and you calculate the average area that a cell has with three neighbors, four neighbors, five neighbors, and so on, normalize it with the average area in that tissue, you're getting the number of neighbors of that cell, minus 2 over 4. And he found that in the cucumber, and it holds in absolute every epithelium. And so the question is, what are, what are the fundamental laws that make every epithelium behave like that? So what can we learn about epithelia, or what can we expect from epithelia? And people have thought about that for quite some while. There's a lot of uh, mathematics done on these kind of polygonal lattices. Um, so there's a huge literature. 
but there were no really good explanations. So one biological explanation uh, was given by uh, um, Perrimon and Gibson. And so they propose that uh, the um, polygon distribution or the neighbor distribution uh, follows from cell division. And so what they propose is that if you have a tissue like that, so you have, I have to be closer to the uh, sensor. Uh, if you have here cells with six neighbors, it undergoes cell division, then you would have two cells with five neighbors and the neighboring cells both acquire vertices and have seven neighbors. Now if you uh, do that repetitively, you come to steady state and there's only a single steady state which you can derive as a Markov chain and in this steady state, depending on whether you have random cell division or longest axis division, you have about 45% hexagons. And so then in the Nature paper, they looked at epithelia from very, very different uh, uh, species. Evolution is very distinct. And they all have about 45% hexagons. And so that uh, was then uh, published in Nature. But like, if you look a little bit more broadly, then you have epithelia with 30 to 80% hexagons. And that is not like noise. And so you can't explain 30 to 80% with cell division if it's only giving you 45%. And uh, at about the same time, Susan Eaton and uh, uh, Frank Jülicher, they looked at a vertex model for epithelia. And vertex model are energy um, minimization uh, arguments. So it's basically a physical model. Um, and the idea here is that on the apical side, the cells adhere, and there's like two main driving forces. One is line tension. So line tension on the one hand side is that if you're putting like some oil into water, it tries to minimize the surface area. But then also between cells, you have adhesion, which tries to maximize the surface area. And so these two are competing in the first term. Uh, so if you have a negative lambda, you have adhesion. If you have a positive lambda, you would have the surface energy effect. And the second term here, so here you have the perimeter, so the sum over the perimeter. And the second effect is the actomyosin contactility, um, where you basically also like shrink the uh, apical surface, try to make it minimal. Uh, and that is uh, a term that has a perimeter squared. And then they have a phenomenological term, which they call area elasticity, with which they regulate how variable the areas can be. Now, when they use that model and they try to reproduce the polygon distribution of Drosophila wingdis, they could do this within the pink parameter space. But intriguingly, only in the small subset here, Lewis law held. And so the question is, like, what is special about those parameter range? And what are we missing uh, to understand epithelial organization? Why would it only hold here? And now the uh, uh, thing is, like, let's consider first a very simple example. Just imagine that all the areas in your epithelium were equal. So we're all equal, we can get rid of the last term. And now you have an energy functional that only depends on the perimeter. Now if you think about how the perimeter depends on the neighbor number, the more neighbors you have, the more circular you're becoming. And that means the smaller your perimeter at a given area. Now, because of uh, Euler's formula, you must have on average six neighbors. So energetically, you would like to have a million neighbors or a billion or whatever, but you can't because on average you need to have six. And then you can see, well, okay, I could either have two hexagons or I could have a square and an octagon, but because you have a nonlinear relationship here, two hexagons always have a smaller combined parameter than a square and an octagon, and that leads to the well-known statement that hexagonal lattices are energetically the most favorable ones. But if that is true, and epithelia were controlled by energy, then why would they not all be hexagons? Why would they have different distributions? Why would you only get 80% and not 100% uh, hexagons? <coughs> now, the thing that really makes a difference is the area variability. Because of growth and cell division, all the areas are different. So now, if we, uh, whoops. If we take this into account, so sorry. Uh, and we take, instead of a hexagon, we take it that has one size, we're taking two of different sizes. Then the combined parameter is smaller than for the two equally sized uh, hexagons, even though the area, the combined area is the same. Now, if you do the same thing for the square and the octagon, and you make the square larger and the octagon smaller, they also reduce in this combined parameter, but they're still larger than the two hexagons. Now, if you make the square smaller and the octagon larger, you get a smaller combined parameter. 
And so that is, means that suddenly a uh, lattice that doesn't have just hexagons but a mix is energetically more favorable. And that is close to what you would expect for Lewis law, means like the smaller cells should have fewer neighbors and the larger cells more neighbors. But the question is like, why would it be linear? Okay, it could be any functional relationship. So now imagine that you wanted to uh, lay a puzzle, a contiguous puzzle out of polygons. And all the polygons had the same area. They would be screwed because they all have different side lengths. And you wouldn't be able to put them together into a lattice unless you squeeze them. If you squeeze them, you increase the parameter at a given area. Now, if you had Lewis law applying, then the edge lengths would be much more similar. <coughs> if the edge lengths are much more similar, your job is much easier. But you could well ask, why not make it perfect? Okay? Why could nature not for once get it right? And what would it take? It would have to have a quadratic relationship rather than a linear relationship. So why do we not see a quadratic relationship? Why do we see a linear relationship? And to answer that, we use simulations. Uh, so we developed a simulation framework to simulate tissue. So the uh, cells uh, have an elastic boundary. So you have here springs. And uh, you have fluid inside and outside the cells. And we would also be able to solve for reaction diffusion equations. Uh, don't do this here. Then we can take our epithelium. We're focusing on the apical side. We have also adhesion, so springs between cells. And now we can simulate uh, a tissue here. In the color code, you're seeing the number of neighbors. And you can see how the, cell, the tissue is growing and changing the neighbor numbers. And in order to make that anywhere relevant, we used the quantitative data from the Drosophila vingus, <laughs> simply because there is so much quantitative data, uh, so that all the parameters are based on uh, data. So that means, in particular, we use the same growth rate as measured in the Drosophila wing disk. We use the same mitotic frequency, uh, and we adjusted the last two free parameters for our springs such that we reproduce the polygon frequencies that you're measuring in the Drosophila wing disk. Now, when we did that, it was a little bit uh, disappointing because the simulations here in pink don't reproduce Lewis law, law in green. So now, as a biologist, you might say, well, come on, this is pretty close. But these are simulations, OK? And so if it doesn't fit, it doesn't fit, you know, because we can rerun them. It's not a matter of uh, technical problems. So what had happened? So the PhD student who ran the simulations, he had divided the cells always at the same area threshold to reproduce the mean cell area that people had measured. And as a result of that, our variability of apical areas in the wing disk was only half. So the CV is a standard deviation over the mean. We had 20%, and normal wing disk has 40%. So he went and uh, made, made this more flexible. So now the cell division threshold is a distribution. And when we did that, we get about the same area distribution. And we're getting Lewis law. And so then you can wonder, well, OK, what happens if you push that and you make it even wider? If you make it even wider, then for the first time, we're seeing a quadratic law. Okay? And so that means that the prediction from the model is that uh, the area variability within the Drosophila wing disk is just not large enough to support the quadratic law. Because as you can see here, so your area variability here has to go to a six-fold difference in the areas, which is huge. Now, our experimental collaborator, Fernando Casares, said that's easy in a Drosophila wing disk. Um, so he just induced so-called gigas clones um, that, where the cells just grow larger. And so you have uh, larger cells, but they're interspersed, so they're really randomly located. So here's the control. For the control, we're getting the linear Lewis law. Now we're in, uh, introducing those gigas clones. The distribution gets wider. And for the first time, we see the quadratic law. And so that means really that the, uh, this here uh, is explaining Lewis law. The second check, sanity check, that you can make is consider an area distribution. And if you have the quadratic law, then each polygon type has its preferred area. And that means that within that distribution, we have a range where we would expect hexagons. Now, if you make that distribution wider, then you lower the fraction of hexagons. We can predict that. And we can compare so that this hexagon, uh, uh, the fraction of hexagons versus the area CV. So that is the standard deviation over the mean for the areas. And then we looked at all the tissues that we had quantified and it fits it perfectly. OK, so the uh, conclusion from that part is that uh, if and only if all your epithelial cells were equal, 
then you would expect that uh, you had hexagonal packing. So this is so unrealistic that even the retina where biologists always keep telling me, yeah, but we have hexagonal packing, you don't. You, know, you either have like something like 80% or in other tissues you're making those hexagons out of non-hexagonal cells. In real tissues you have an intermediate variability and for this intermediate variability you're getting Lewis law to get equal side lengths or similar side lengths. Now if you further increase that variability you're going to see a quadratic law. So what about above Weyer's law? So that was the tough one. So the, this was the harder one. So why would you have this uh, relationship with the neighbors? Uh, remember, on average, you should have six neighbors. If that would also hold locally, then you would have this green curve. Again, as about as you might say, that's pretty close. But again, this is mathematics, so that is pretty far. Okay? And so the intriguing thing is that in all epithelia, you have above Weyer's law. But if you look at regular lattices, you never have it. So if you have a hexagonal lattice here, so in black, you have the above Weyer law in the epithelium. In red here for a hexagonal lattice. And you can also have like a different one here of squares and octagons, which is like this light blue one. You know, they're all off. And so then the question is like, why are they all off? Now, the first thing that you can realize is like in order to get such a pattern, your cells would have to behave extremely well. So you would have to need to have the right areas, relative areas at the right positions in order to build this lattice. If you do something wrong, then uh, you would get some irregularities and you wouldn't get these regular lattices anymore. The other thing is like at each vertex point, your angles have to add up to 360 degrees. So this is a topological constraint. And so that means that if you are a cell and you have made up your mind what kind of num neighbor number you have, then you have only limited choices for the other two angles. If you make it fair and you share the remaining angle that you still have, 360 minus the theta n, then you end up with a constraint of what kind of uh, average neighbor numbers you can have. If you compare that to above Weyer's law, it's even further away. However, why share fairly? You could also distribute this over, over the entire curve. So like for each neighbor number, like for a triangle, you have 60 degrees, for a square, 90 degrees. But you could just share this uh, over the entire distribution if you do that. It's pretty close already to above Weyer's law, but not in the range where you really care. It means like for low neighbor numbers. But this means now that the uh, uh, cell is irregular, so we would need to also allow for an irregular angle here. And if we do that, we can perfectly get to above Weyer's law. It means like because of that constraint of having 360 degrees, that basically limits the kind of neighbors that a cell can have. That gives you above Weyer's law, but now we have one free parameter, how irregular those polygons can be. So we can validate now uh, the theory with experiments. So here you have data from the Drosophila ring disk. So that would be above Weyer's law in white. We can do better with our theory. We can get a closer fit, but we have one free parameter. And now from that, we have like a prediction of how irregular the angle should be. And we can measure that since it's a little ring disk. We're finding these angle distributions for each neighbor number. The average is always that of the regular, uh, of a regular polygon of that type. So square has 90 degrees and so on. And now the predicted irregularity in red matches that that you see in the tissue almost perfectly. And so that means that this theory can also explain uh, the, uh, uh, the above Weyer's law. And also, as predicted, all the cells essentially are irregular. For yellow, you would have regular polygons. All the, uh, all the uh, polygons are irregular because you have to fit them into the lattice. So in summary, for the apical organization, you uh, uh, see the apical organization that minimizes the lateral cell surface contact energy. Uh, you have an area variability that arises from cell growth and cell division. And so that is really like it's not topology, it's really just like cell growth and cell division creates that uh, variability. And therefore, like, you can't have regular lattices, you have irregular lattices. And then Lewis law emerges to make sure that the side lengths are the most equal that they can be. And above Weyer's law emerges in order to get angles that are closest to that of a regular polygon uh, that uh, could be. So like in the last few minutes, I think I have only very few minutes left, at least to according to the counter. Uh, what does this mean for 3D? So we're interested in what FSC don't look just on the apical side, but in 3D. And uh, 
especially would like to do this in growing apathy here. So what we did is like we imaged growing lungs and kidneys in the light sheet. Uh, and that's what you're getting. So here is a, a branching uh, lung. The thing is growing in the light sheet, so we have linear volume growth. And we did the 3D segmentation of those uh, epithelia, and that's what you're seeing there. So that's the organization of uh, cells in 3D. And now the question is, like, how are they organized? So, I mean, it's pretty to look at, but why do they have the shape uh, that we are seeing? And recently there was a paper that looked at that and uh, suggested that the uh, 3D shapes uh, would be there in order to accommodate geometry changes from the outside <coughs> to the inside. So that's basically the old idea. So if you have like a flat epithelium where the apical and basal side were the same, you might just have such a prism structure. At least that's the theory. Now if your apical side is smaller than the basal side, then in order to make that thing fit, then you could have some, something like a frustum or you could have a prismatoid. And recently, there was a suggestion, if you go even wider, imagine a tube. If you have a tube, then you're shrinking in one direction as you go from basal to apical. But in longitudinal direction, you're not, you don't have to shrink. And that creates further problems in order to accommodate the neighbor changes that you need. They said, like, well, you need one T1 transition, one neighbor change along that axis. And that leads to scutoids. Now, if you look at this for real, that's what you're getting. And you're getting an enormous number of neighbor changes. You're not getting one, you're getting really a lot of neighbor changes. And if you look at uh, Lewis law, it still follows Lewis law. That's unexpected because only on the African side do you have adhesion. But they're so tightly packed, you're getting Lewis law for all layers. So here we have a color code from dark blue to yellow, uh, from apical to basal. And you can see that for the first time, we're also seeing the quadratic law. So on the apical side of a lung tube, you're getting the quadratic law because we have enough variability here. And uh, the theory, a theoretical prediction of hexagon <coughs> frequency versus area CV is still met. So what does this mean? It means the same physics is governing not only the apical side, but the 3D organization of the epithelium. It means like in all places, not just on the apical side, you minimize the lateral contact surface energy. Okay? And you can see this also like when you focus on uh, very few cells. We have these spatial T1 transitions and they're correlated with changes in, apical, in, in the cross-sectional area. And you uh, can see this also in time. And the nice thing in time is that you have in these uh, proliferative epithelia, you have interkinetic nuclear migration. It means that the nucleus is migrating from the apical side to the basal side and up again. And uh, if you uh, follow that, you can see that you get these shape changes and they induce these T1 transitions. So that means for the 3D organization for, uh, of epithelia is that we have numerous T1 transitions along the Africa basis uh, axis and in time. Uh, they are uh, most likely driven by this interkinetic nuclear migration uh, and by cell growth and cell division. And this cross-sectional area distribution completely determines the neighbor numbers. And that means that the um, uh, 3D organization of the cells uh, follows from uh, a surface energy minimization. So that's uh, uh, the main part of my talk. So where are we going from here? I mean, this is always very difficult to show. But this is basically a 3D branching event in, uh, in lungs. <clears throat> so the next step is really to understand what determines the angles of outgrowth, because now that we understand the physics of epithelia, we can now focus on what happens if you have active forces like apical constriction. How does this change the uh, geometry of the epithelium? And the other part that we're interested in is like these lung tubes, they elongate, and you have biased outgrowth, so you have twofold <coughs> more elongations and widening, and so what drives that elongating outgrowth in those uh, tubes? So in summary, what I try to convince you of today is that uh, patterning on growing domains is based on uh, diffusion in pre-steady state. So we don't need any further feedback regulators. It's just dynamic scaling on a growing domain. And silico organogenesis, I mean, you can do this with any 3D uh, organ structure. But in terms of the lungs and kidneys, we propose that you have ligand receptor-based Turing mechanisms that explain patterning in 3D and 4D. And finally, epithelial organization <coughs> is driven by the minimization 
of the lateral cell cell contact uh, surface energy. So thank you uh, for listening, and that is the current team that is doing the work. Thank you. We have time for questions down here in front. Thanks for a lovely talk. Um, so in, in the last part of the talk, you refer to the area of variability and you use it as a kind of input to your models. It's just that's what it is, so you have to fit that. But we also know that uh, forces within tissues affect the rate of growth and when cells divide. So can you get that area of variability to emerge directly out of the model? Well, I mean, that is basically the last part of the 3D organization, right? Because if you have the bag of water, and then you have the nucleus that is shifting through, then in a way you would be able to predict it. But like, I mean, this is obviously very complex, right? Because you have too many things that are happening. So we're using it as an input, but for us it was more like what's the physics behind it. So we're not trying to uh, predict the apical surface areas, right? I mean, this is, I wouldn't, well, I'm not motivated enough because I wouldn't know what for, you know? I mean, that's the main thing. Um. Any other questions? Down in front, right there. There's a microphone coming to you. So your second mechanism, which says Turing-based uh, uh, operation, perhaps, do you think that your cells are communicating with each other, just like the um, uh, neural cells that communicate with each other? They actually form connections similar to synapses. You mean like <coughs> via tight junctions or whatever? Well, I don't know whether they do anything on top. Um, I wouldn't have an opinion. But, but what, what do you mean by Turing mechanism? OK, I didn't introduce that. Um, it's a self-organizing mechanism that uh, comes from the dynamics. So like you would have a reaction network that normally would be in steady state, in a stable steady state. And if now these two components, you need at least two components, diffuse at different speeds, then it can happen that you get a self-organizing event that introduces like stripes and patterns, and that's how this is happening. So it's a dynamic instability, essentially, that occurs only uh, under certain, uh, in certain parameter ranges. OK, thank you. Any other questions? OK, thank you.